Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I had a bit of a late start this morning, but we're going to jump right in. Smoke in Missoula is pretty much have cleared up, and we've gotten to those uh, normal rainy days here in the city of Missoula. It was wet this morning. Uh, those storms over Sunday night last week kind of took care of most of the smoke in the Missoula area, and the weather was pretty much pleasant throughout the week. We can expect a lot of rain showers and storms throughout this weekend. Also, going into Memorial Day weekend, uh, you know, if you're getting out of town, this is the perfect time to do it. It's going to be kind of rainy, rainy and uh, scummy outside. And there's also MissCon, which is a big uh, annual event that happens here in the city of Missoula, celebrating everything fandom for pretty much 37 years. This is their 37th annual uh, fandom event. So if you're interested in doing that kind of stuff, uh, they have a bunch of different events happening at the uh, Holiday Inn Express. Um, also, uh, let's see, uh, I'll have more on this during my event segment uh, and a lot more for city council. So I'm going to kind of... Uh, go over some of the things happening in the state of Montana and Missoula. So jumping around in recently, Montana Governor Jean Forte vetoed a bill that would take tax revenue from the marijuana tax to fix country roads aimed to preserve our natural resource, protect hunting and fishing opportunities and, and to support our veterans. That has since been vetoed. And over the past weekend, just the weekend, was, there was 2,500 people signed petitions to put pressure to overturn the veto, which requires a two thirds vote. And the funny thing is, is that it already pretty much got the two thirds, if not of uh, uh, four fifths uh, vote to get this passed in the first place. But it was such a weird kind of uh, circumstance that Greg, Greg Jean Forte was basically saying he's going to veto this at kind of like the 11th hour. But the person who was told didn't rely and tell everyone about it just in time. So basically, uh, the veto of this bill happened an hour before the uh, 68th Montana legislature session ended. And so because of that, it was such a weird gray area. Part of this was like, oh, you vetoed it during the legislative sessions, therefore you had to do it during the legislative session to overturn the veto, but uh, they, they weren't informed and now there's a whole mess happening right now trying to figure out exactly how they're gonna move forward with this because if he vetoed it after legislative session, they would have the opportunity to, to uh, fall into that secondary category of being able to get in contact with the Secretary of the State, which would go out and pull all the uh, House uh, representatives in the legislature to move this forward. So that's one of the many things that are happening in our state, along with TikTok, which has de reportedly decided to uh, uh, basically started to counter sue Montana in the process of uh, backlash from the state law that would uh, ban the popular app of January of 2024. You know, there's no logistics when it comes to enforcing some of the things that with TikTok, but that's just a whole nother uh, thing. And I believe that, uh, I mean, this is coming from me personally, is like, I think that the reason why Montana banned TikTok in the first place was to set a precedent to basically say that is like, hey, you know, we respect privacy. We want to make sure that you guys uh, know that, you know, you can't fly balloons up in here in Montana and expect us to look the other way. Basically, that's kind of how I <laughs> interpreted it. Uh, Trump also tried to force a sale or ban on the company that runs it, uh, BitDance, in 2020, with federal judges overturning that. President Joe Biden passed a no TikTok in government in the 2022, with dozens of states having enacted similar bans on TikToks and on state-issued devices and places as well. So right now, plaintiffs for TikTok's plan to go further, and the ban on banning completely on the grounds as it is unconstitutional and preempted by federal law violates the first and 14th amendment rights and the foreign affairs and commerce clauses of the u.s constitution montana whether you agree with it or not the ban or not it brings up a big issue that's going to be brought to the forefront um, and it got some bipartisan support from uh, senator uh, john tester democrat of montana uh, showed support for this ban and in many ways this sets a tone that Montana is willing to take on big tech platforms to get some kind of regulation to the highest levels. He said in the Haver Daily News, TikTok CEO Sho Chow testified before Congress and it was a train wreck and he and the company should be held accountable through the courts uh, for any tre uh, treasonous things they have done. Even so, Meta just got a major lawsuit filed against them from the European Union for similar things about selling uh, users data for, uh, you know, profit and basically uh, 
to sell people stuff. That's pretty much one of the things that are happening there. I can't talk too much about this as it's going on further and Meta is appealing this case and just short of pulling the social media giant firm, Europe will continue serving them in the future. Another big thing that's happening, um, Blue Origin is getting the $3.4 billion contract with NASA as they prepare to land rovers on the moon. Coming out of losing a bid two years ago, SpaceX, uh, Jeff Bezos company Blue Origin decided to sue, holding up the moon travel by more than a year as a result. And so far the deal with NASA will get, in, get them into orbit of the moon and the private industry will take the landing from there with a nice one billion dollars kicked in by Blue Origin for good measure. It looks like the, uh, to, it'll help grease the wheels. Like at SpaceX, Blue Origin plans to practice landing on the moon without a crew before astronauts are on board. So Blue Origin will be uh, use its still in development new Glenn rocket as a lunar missions from Cape Canaveral Starship, the world's largest starship, made its debut last month from South Texas, which the flight ended in an explosion. The series of trips will test the ability to land after astronauts make it into lunar, lunar orbit sometime next year for Operation Artemis. So up next, we got uh, a nice tease from our uh, Music in Missoula show uh, with Gary Gillette, uh, with his uh, guest, uh, Steve Hesla, and it's all available online on our YouTube page, MCAT TV Missoula. So here's a, t here's a taste. You just go, did I you got, really, did we, you like, are you a basketball down. geek? Well, Gary and I go to the, the, all the games, right? The Is men, that right? We, I mean, you have to choose, so we go to the men's games. And <coughs> we, a few years ago, we went to the women's games, you know, you sort of spread it around. But we wanted to see the guys do well down in uh, Boise. So we watched the game. We were cheering like crazy. And, and it mattered, you know, because there aren't that many people. So you're sure. at the top of your lungs. And they can tell that they're being supported. That someone there that cares. Yeah, and they won, you know, against uh, Idaho State. Yeah, the it, first one. Huh? The first one. And it was like a, you know, a fight to the finish because nobody wants to be the loser. Everybody wants to be the winner. <laughs> I, I think we're I think we're live. This is Music in Missoula. I'm Gary Gillette, and it's so nice that, that uh, you tuned in to check out what the, what this little episode might be about and what's happening. And I, I think that uh, I think we've got this sucker on record, ah, and we've got it confirmed, and uh, everything should just be fine. Hey, our guest today is Stephen Hessler, and Stephen and I are uh, um, we know each other vaguely from being musicians in a small town and we've done a few things together but not many you know he, he's on a different level than than i am and uh the, what we do have in common that we're musicians and we're, we're 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 still making music we're just doing it more part-time now in our retirement <laughs> uh and one of the cool things about <clears throat> that i found about the, the uh, occupation of my uh, uh, is also my hobby is that uh, we uh, uh, we make music and we just are lucky enough to find an avenue to be able to get paid for it and uh, make an almost living but in fact that uh, our vocation is also an avocation and that even though I, I don't I no longer get a, a, a check from Missoula County Public Schools uh, that uh, I'm still making music and get smaller checks from different places now. But, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the fellows I taught with uh, that, uh, that 
taught math or science, you know, and their, their careers came to a screeching halt for the most part. Um, and then they're trying to figure out what they're going to do in their lives. Uh, Probably the kids' uh, dance party promo is probably one of my best uh, <laughs> ideas I've had in a long time. I, I really love showing that. Whether you like it or not, I love showing it. But uh, let's jump right into some movies that are coming out this weekend. We're kicking things off with a Little Mermaid live action remake with Melissa McCarthy being the next gay icon as Ursula. We dive in yet to another Disney live action remake in a series of remakes that blends worlds of the sea. And with the sea, the main actress field all the ignorant questions about the production that decided to give her the great opportunity and that dead night closed the fine print on the internet trolls. This movie will probably be a shot for shot remake with uh, all, all of the songs on track with some original songs that people will be like, yeah, cool. But still, you know, that Ursula song is still kind of meh. You know, hey, listen, like it's not really that well, the, the lyrics are kind of like, it's not great. It's, 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 a, it's a memorable song, yes, but it's not really that great. But anyways, I'm outraged that they didn't get the guy from uh, Sishu to play the muscle daddy uh, King Triton, but they uh, basically gave the man a shirt. Um, up next, uh, while you're, you know, while the uh, King Triton is having a shirt on, a guy who probably should have a shirt on is doing a movie called The Machine, while your daughters and uh, my uh, bronies are watching uh, Disney enjoy a drug and alcohol-fueled movie about a comedian who had a crazy story about his uh, college years in a trip to Russia, and uh, now he's kind of expanding upon it and making this whole movie about it. Watch as he tries to impress his dad on a globetrotting adventure that brings U.S.-Russian relations that our leaders can never do. Uh, I may be giving <laughs> this movie more credit than it deserves, but this is just a, a comedian story coming to fruition in the end, so perhaps this might be the end of his comedy career. Um, about my father, old school meets new school in this movie that stars Robert De Niro in this comedy about a wise guy and his uh, uh, soy boy son. This tough guy meets supportive in-laws and dares to judge their weird family traditions. Watch as a Martin Scorsese call sheet gets stolen by one of the actors to get yet another one of those old stubborn dad performances. Meet the parents, but like the parents, meet the in-laws so much like the sequel that my speech impediment will not be able to uh, say the sequel to the movie Meet the Parents without accidentally uh, alarming the FCC. On, um, so anyways, this, these kind of movies feel like they're kind of like, you know, they happen, funny stunts and touching moments followed by an ending gag, I suppose. All right, and then we got this movie. Uh, where watch Gerald Butler in his uh, Bruce Willis action movie phase on continuation as he follows a disgruntled badass and his Middle Eastern translator as they navigate a hostile random country in the shoot first, ask questions later. But when you ask too many questions, the answer is a bullet. And this movie is running from special forces, but not, it's like, corrupt special forces and then the only person you can trust is the native and then the native has to hide and blah blah blah, blah. you know that's basically what your movie and so anyways you know i heard his movie plane was good there was a plane in that movie uh by invitation only this movie kind of feels like it's made super indie and it's kind of like okay well it's a single location shoot you know those kind of movies do okay but uh this movie apparently got some kind of release this week and uh, camera looks very soft and kind of like when we made Nature Guy Resurrection here at MCAT. Uh, plot time, we have a group of people play a game and win the ultimate prize. And since this is a horror, thrill, th horror thriller, how far will these challenges and these people go to win the prize in the end? So those are the movies that are coming out this weekend. Up next, I have a new dub and stuff uh, from the 1935 movie, uh, Death by Television. Yeah. No, I've had my car for five years. I don't have an extended warranty. Oh, jeez, oh, jeez, oh, jeez, he's dead. Oh, my God, I can't believe he's dead. Are you okay? Uh, what am I going to do? Oh, 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 your shoes are untied. Oh, hey, guys, what's going on? Dick! What's wrong with him? I don't know. He asked me to tie his shoes while laying down, but now he just didn't respond. Oh, that sounds very believable. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, he's dead. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree, too. Oh, he's totally dead. Well, I guess we gotta go call the police. 
Now, what exactly happened here? I guess this gamer is AFK forever. There's a man that's dead here. Please explain what happened. Oh, I don't have anything to do with it. If that's what you're insinuating. I thought you heard me say that your story already checked out. Well, all right then. I guess we're good then. Very good. Don't you believe me? Well, of course I believe you, sir. Well, then let's get back to the party or whatever. Isn't that why we're all dressed what up? What seems oh, to be no. the commotion in here? You're not going to want to see this. Oh, I like to look at things oh. that are interesting. It's Dick. He's dead. Oh, my poor Richard. All right. Yes. How? Mm. Why? Cool your jets. Who could have done this? All right. You know exactly who did this. Oh, no, no, no. Nonsense. He probably died of a heart attack or whatever. Hmm. Fragile lives, these lives they live. Hmm. Keep everyone here, except for that guy. He weirds me mm. out. Sir, we shouldn't lock down the house. We know exactly who did it. It's that guy who's clearly just standing there staring at us weirdly. Listen, I know he looks guilty, but it's usually not the guilty person who's the guilty person. Sir, you said you'd listen to me more after you'd watch Triangle of Sadness. <laughs> you don't think that one percenter over there behind that magic box is guilty? Oh, no. I... I'm very innocent. See, look at these papers. Mm, let's just check this out. I am innocent. Checks out to me. Hey guys, welcome back. Let's jump right in as the uh, city council is really filled up with the biggest issue that's happening here in the city of Missoula and that is urban camping that is going to the big part of just being in view of just everyone in the city of Missoula seeing the real issues of homelessness happening in the city of Missoula. You know, there's one of the things that definitely happened, pandemic made it a lot harder for people. A lot of people actually started ended up moving to Missoula. So people who are already on the edge basically got shoved down. If not, if they're not uh, punching their last uh, uh, punch card when it comes to couch surfing or they're staying in their cars, this is the very real uh, problem that's happening in the city of Missoula. They were saturated with ARPA money that helped them uh, supply a lot of uh, facilities and staff time and work with consultants to work with this. But homelessness is a lot deeper issue when it comes down to this. And I just wanted to make this that the big takeaway we recognize um, uh, this last, this past month, the city's uh, in the process of working with many different policies in place to kind of uh, mitigate the uh, camping in city and county parks in the city of Missoula, since those are the one of the bigger concerns about people who want to go on the trails be just be able to go for a run, go walk with their dog, have their kids play on a playground, and those are one of the biggest concerns. So we bring back Travis Matier is back in council and gives public comment in response of the city's action uh, taking a recess on him just uh, last week. So this is what he had to say. Because I know you guys like democracy. I know you guys are working hard for this town and for the safety of everyone in it. Um, I don't feel safe. And my personal life is really, really difficult right now, but that's not your guys' responsibility. Your responsibility are for the people that are voting for you, um, even the houseless ones, okay? Uh, and Harley was a member of this community, even though uh, he wasn't regarded necessarily all that well in Salmon, Idaho, where he stabbed someone and almost killed him. But, you know, we all make mistakes, and I'm trying not to speak too loudly. And I'm gonna walk slowly out of here, so uh, the adjective storming can't be applied to me. I'm gonna walk really slowly deliberately, maybe even reflectively. Um, I'm going to let you guys continue with your business. Good night. Mr. Matier. Okay. So that was Travis Matier um, in response to his uh, uh, the, the forced recess that the city put on him uh, after he left. So Kevin Hunt, resident, uh, response to the city's uh, uh, position on the Travis Matier discourse that uh, happened last week. I, you can say whatever you want, and we all like a nice atmosphere, but you cannot prohibit speech based on content. The statements by Mr. Matier, for which he was interrupted and point of order last week, were not loud, they were not abusive, they were not threatening. They didn't meet any of the criteria that you just recited, Mr. Mayor, none. And yet he was, he was shut down. That's why sitting right here, I said, you're violating his constitutional rights. Whereupon one of the council councilors claimed I was shouting apparently, uh, and that, then we had a recess and all of that. So this this just can't continue. So, you know, I urge people to educate yourselves a little bit about what is and isn't allowed to be said in a public forum. 
especially one that is provided by a governing body. Okay. And uh, Kevin Hunt continued to talk a little bit more about that uh, moving forward. Not to mention, uh, we have, um, you know, a little bit of more background for those of you just tuning in. Travis Mateer spoke about the man who recently died on the streets and who is also one that can be categorized as anti-shelter. Maybe folks are trying to get into permanent housing, had a bad experience that uh, soured them on the public housing institution. Frankly, there are a lot of folks who have come in, come up and spoken to the city to complain about the, how the Pavarella Center is run. Uh, Patrick Montgomery uh, gave comment about public safety near the Pav, and this is what he had to say. Did have a short-lived uh, increase of the police patrolling in the area, and that did work as long as it was maintained. But of course, there wasn't the personnel or funding to maintain it. Then, about a year and a half ago, you, along with uh, Mayor Engen, came up with a plan using, I believe, ARPA money, money to uh, have a permanent uh, presence in our neighborhood, and it literally changed our lives. Uh, the, the individuals patrolling got to know the neighborhood. Uh, we could show them the spots that were vulnerable. And it, except I think in one year, I only made one, uh, had to make one 9 call. And I've, I've heard that it reduced calls a lot. Now, unfortunately, that uh, I, four or five months ago, that, um, that type of patrolling stopped. And, and my understanding is now it's more of an and I might be wrong on this, it's more of a as-needed basis and more the uh, Pavarello area only. I called the patrolling company and they said they do not go to private areas. All right, so one of the bigger issues is that with the ARPA money, there was a constant contact with a lot of these communities to uh, provide some kind of uh, overhead safety and people talking to some of the people who were um, in the area and certain aspects and de-escalating situations that may arise. And then a lot of times when the police only respond to uh, calls of emergency. So the preventative measure for staffing in terms of de-escalating situations uh, are basically now gone and now they're going back to the old model of what, the way it was because the uh, bond didn't get passed last November in which was meant to kind of carry on these Operation Shelter programs that would have constant contacts, not to mention the additional shelter spacing for folks to stay in a place, a designated zone. And now it's just kind of like, as a result, the money rich uh, city used the money to get security in all the areas that established shelters in Missoula. However, the city and county wanted to expand their services by increasing our taxes on the bid to continue this, which it failed, which the city is trying their best to work with what they have. So uh, Linda Wolf is another resident uh, seeing the state of Montana, a state of Missoula's growing displacement issues. And this is uh, her reaction to homelessness in Missoula. I park on the side of East Broadway. I go down to the place they were, and there's a homeless man sitting on the sidewalk, asking me for money. And I gave him, I gave him some money, and um, and I said, "Where are you from? Where are your people? You know, are you are you from here?" And he said, "No, he was from Virginia." And I said, "Well, why are you here? You know, why don't you want to be around your family? You look like you're you could use some help." He goes, "No, I like it here." I don't need, I'm fine. I'm fine, there's nothing wrong. I said, well, you don't look like it. I mean, you, you're sitting on a sidewalk. You probably aren't doing the, this isn't the best life you could be living. You, know, you want some help, some services or something? Nope, nope. It's just, and the police have also told me, I talk to them quite often, that they will arrest transients sometimes and take things out of their pockets and there's tickets that they've gotten from other towns and cities in Montana to Missoula. Yeah, and that's like a, a, it's an ongoing rumor for sure when it comes to just people being bused to the city of Missoula from different places in the state and beyond. Um, you know, she did speak in length about driving by the pub and seeing cop cars and ambulances near the shelter and having neighbors in the form of a displaced mobile home that she cannot do anything about. It's very heartbreaking to see these kinds of things happen in Missoula. And jumping ahead, Mayor uh, uh, Jordan Hess responds to uh, many of the folks' concerns on this matter. Frankly, our community needs way, way, way more monetary resources to adequately address this problem. This is, um, this is a problem that is going to be highly visible this summer. It's a problem that we are going to have to uh, do our best to triage. And it's a problem that um, we're going to need uh, some public uh, understanding that, um, that we have very limited tools and very limited funding. We 
Um, that doesn't mean that we don't try. That doesn't mean that we won't keep trying. Um, I will just say anecdotally, our parks department has on numerous occasions sent out crews of, of 20 to 30 people uh, cleaning up encampments in parks. Uh, we have just by one example, that was done on a Wednesday. Uh, the next day there were seven tents. The next day there were 17 tents and um, this happens over and over and over again. The answer in my opinion is sheltering. We need to provide places for people to be. We need to provide mental health support. We need to provide services that um, that um, have better outcomes than just simply trying to move someone along. But that's something that we lack budget to do right now. All right, so that's uh, um, that was Jordan has basically explaining that there's very little that the, the city can do to help the people. The only thing that the city can do is work with uh, the, the people and figure out a way to find a more uh, sustainable place for these people to go. But at the same time, you know, Jordan cannot say that, you know, you know, the whole, it's, it's weird because, you know, because the bond didn't pass, it's the whole idea is that maybe a good majority of the Missoulians didn't want to pay for um, some of the homeless people in general. So Dana Carlino, City uh, Council, takes aim at the council for some of their actions and inactions. The council's definitely partially responsible for the homelessness um, issue, homelessness crisis around Missoula right now. And we should take this on with empathy and um, with solutions that can help solve this upstream, not spending millions of dollars responding to this issue. Um, and the city ordinance that the city's bringing up um, to try and make it to where we can move people from parkland um, without providing anywhere for them to go that we're seeing on Wednesday is absolutely the wrong direction. Um, and I also submitted a referral for Wednesday for us to have a council discussion about urban camping solutions. Um, just because since the Johnson Street shelter and authorized campsites have closed, we've seen an increase in urban camping, which is causing safety issues to the people who are camping and safety issues to the community. Um, and I would appreciate it if we could get my referral onto the schedule and not have to um, have other council members blocking other council members from having referrals about these important um, topics in town. So I'd really appreciate it if the council president did not block referrals and allowed every council member to use their right to bring a re referral forward and try to have policy discussions. Um, but ultimately, I'm just very disappointed in the city right now and disappointed in um, in not even allowing us to have a discussion about urban camping in the public realm. Okay, and then Gwen Jones, Council President, responds to Daniel Carlino's claims. I've been saying this for months, has been on making sure and doing what we can to make sure that we have dollars for the emergency winter shelter because when folks are outside during the winter camping, they can die from exposure. We are seeing people right now this summer, and, and I agree with the comments made around the horseshoe tonight. It's a change. We are not used to seeing people, but summer camping is very different from winter camping. It's a life or death situation in the winter. So that that's, that's the first priority to try and figure out with this budget this summer, and then we'll go from there. Um, trying to find creative solutions is great. And I think we look to all of our sister cities across America and the Intermountain West to see what they're doing to come up with good ideas. Um, Mr. Carlino, you have a referral that you want to get on the floor to discuss ideas for urban camping. I appreciate that, but I think some work needs to go into it first to come up with some ideas and have a proposal instead of just throwing it out there because we have limited staff time and limited staff capacity. All right. So that was the response to Dana Carlino's uh, attempt to try to get a conversation really going with uh, homelessness, even though it is something that the city is currently working on and working with the different departments, as I'm going to get into a little bit after this next report, which is a little bit more of a, a saving grace for a lot of uh, affordable housing issues that are happening in the city of Missoula. And so this is part of uh, the Housing Redevelopment and Community Programs using a place called home, which is one of the ways the city is addressing housing needs in the community and the successes of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. So Emily Harris shares from this program talks more about this program. We're just acknowledging that we are in a scarcity space at this point. And so while we would love to do it all, um, our resources don't allow us to do that unless we make some hard choices together and with the community around what that looks like. Um, and because we have finite funding, um, we just consider impact and budget and all of the planning that we do. 
Um, oh, I want to go back. Uh, we also just, you know, as Ricky said, we don't do this in a vacuum. Uh, we have such incredible um, partners and uh, incredible organizations and community members that we work with last uh, work with. Last, yesterday was a very like prominently community focused day for our housing work. I had a housing policy uh, working group that's the subcommittee or sub working group of the Affordable Housing Resident Oversight Committee. And then I was going to go to the city chats in the park to talk to people about housing and housing policy. All right, so uh, that's just one of the many uh, aspects of like, you know, planning and figuring things out uh, moving forward. The harder choices uh, being those neighborhoods growing inwards as many of these policies have reaching community needs over neighborhood wants. And that seems to be a big issue when it comes to every time there's like a rezoning, a proposal, there is some neighborhood uh, um, you know, input saying that they don't want this kind of stuff in their neighborhood. And I've seen it so frequently, it's not even funny at this point. It's gotten to the point where uh, some places as far as, you know, you know, the, the more recent one is Wyoming Street and this new development where they're basically rezoned it to have more infill and more development on there. Uh, the community of that neighborhood was able to uh, uh, put a, uh, a protest uh, and do a petition of protest and they got the two-thirds majority of their neighborhood to actually put this in place which requires the uh, city of Missoula to have a two-thirds vote which the city did vote in favor of this so that, that's just one of the many harder choices that have been been, been made and a place called home reflects that so Emily uh, Harris Shears talks more about the growth of Missoula and this is what she had to say and I pulled this from um, page 12 of A Place to Call Home in the executive summary. This quote gets um, used a lot in the community, especially in neighborhoods that feel that they're taking um, a, a bigger share of housing response. Um, and I know that it's been a focus of members in the Affordable Housing Resident Oversight Committee. And it's really just a reminder that we know that growth is inevitable in our community, both by population growth and housing need. Um, continuing to grow, and that we see opportunity for maintaining um, livable, equitable, and um, sustainable communities throughout Missoula and all neighborhoods having a responsibility in that. And so that's something that we're looking for in our housing policy work when we think about location of developments and how we can partner with um, developers or what we might fund through the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Um, and I think that this just really captures that well. And uh, also, I should also mention, um, for those neighborhoods who are really worried about in terms of like how development is going in terms of certain places, because they, you know, you know, one of the things is like, well, you know, like, oh, what if they're going to build this huge giant monstrosity in my suburban neighborhood? One of the things that they have done is, in to help mitigate even some of those bigger homes in the university district was they had a character overlay that they uh, implemented for the university district that they kind of put it along throughout the city of Missoula. So the whole purpose of this was to basically make sure that any building and, and construction that happened on certain neighborhoods could match the aesthetic of the neighborhood. So even if they do have a higher density infill, it, th there's still a chance to be able to use this character overlay. So the key word is character overlay. So if you are worried about it, that is one of the um, ways in which you can move forward on this. And, you know, our Missoula place called home, many of these things span from uh, community outreach over the last couple of years, 3,600 members of the city of Missoula we're uh, working in engaging with Missoula, and you can engage with all these developments by going to engagemissoula.com to reply to concerns pretty quickly from, uh, uh, just from personal experience, I've, uh, I've sent some concerns to ask, to ask about little, just tiny questions here and there, and they have responded pretty promptly. And yeah, so that's kind of what's happening there, and we're gonna go right back into uh, some of the addressing homelessness issue. And so during climate conservation and parks, emphasis on the parks, uh, addressed urban camping further. Mayor Hess uh, addresses the issue a little bit further, and this is what he had to say about that. We're in an unfortunate situation. We're doing the best we can with limited resources, and the the item before you here today is a targeted amendment to Chapter 12.40 uh, of Missoula Municipal Code, and this will allow us to um, to uh, change the way that we do enforcement. I want to I want to say that uh, we recently stood up a a team internally at the city. Uh, this team came together at my request and is meeting weekly. 
uh, and, and actually frequently much more than that. And this is the Urban Camping Policy Advisory Team. This team includes members of the parks, or I mean, this, this team includes leadership from the Parks Department, the Police Department, the City Attorney's Office, the uh, Public Works Department, our Code Compliance Officer within CPDI, and as well as our um, Community Programs Development and Innovation Director. And so the main focus of what they're trying to do is try to figure out the legal ways to move people out of the uh, city parks um, effectively. So, uh, you know, it's uh, and so far the team is working together to work within the legal system to create a system that addresses these issues by establishing tools to remove encampments that have been popping up illegally in parks and basically having task force within the parks to help clean up these sites as they pop up. So Jordan talks about these teams. Um, a little bit further about what they've been doing. Parks Department recently dispatched 27 parks employees to clean up um, two dump truck loads of of, of litter and and um, debris, um, and uh, the very next day had encampments uh, back in in the same location. And so, I think providing some some transparency to the council and to the public about all of the work that is happening and all of the challenges that we're facing um, is uh, something that we're happy to do. I also want to uh, reiterate, I mentioned at the outset that this this is really a state and a federal issue and we're we're in communication with our um, with our congressional delegation, um, but we're also in communication with with mayors and with cities around the state and comparing notes on what they're doing and we're all looking to each other. I mean, this is an issue in in Bozeman. It's an issue in Billings. It's an issue in Kalispell. It's it's even an issue in in Great Falls and Helena and they don't they don't normally see uh, uh, urban camping issues like like the other cities I mentioned do. So it's it's something where we're all working together on trying to find a solution. Um, I and yeah, and uh, it seems like a lot of the solution has a tendency to move the problem somewhere else at this particular point in time. I mean, um, City Attorney uh, Ryan uh, Sedbury talked about some of these uh, tools the parks can use uh, legally uh, to remove some of the folks. This um, amendment it's it's our opinion that it falls in line with the Boise and Grants Pass cases. In fact, uh, in one of the footnotes to the Grants Pass case, that court specifically cited other cases from uh, federal district courts in the Ninth Circuit that uh, allowed municipalities to um, cite people for being in in areas that were closed so long as there were other there were other public lands that were available for them to sleep or camp overnight. And uh, so we think this is, uh, like the mayor said, a, a targeted amendment to give us another tool in the toolbox. All right, so th what this basically means is that parks are owned by a municipality. Technically, it's the city property in the parks, and we got a lot of open space here enough to basically move them to another open space area. And so this is kind of what they're doing to help mitigate those kind of public parks where you want your kids to play and be able to go on the trails and stuff like that. And so that is addressing the issue in terms of uh, the citizens of Missoula in terms of having to see this kind of thing happening in the city of Missoula versus actually helping the people which they haven't really discussed and they're not this isn't about helping homeless people this is mostly about helping the public spaces is, that are managed by the parks but much like our library that manages books and allows anyone to use the services provided they have uh, effectively made it kind of easier for folks to move in open space and is one of the many available places in town like Missoula folks can go unbothered city parks and that kind of stuff it's it's interesting it's you know it's one of those components of the issue related to parks only but for folks in the community that are very concerned so kevin hunt gives public comment in reaction to some of these uh, uh changes and whatnot houses persons could sleep on designated primary commuter trails 24 hours per day and residents would be obstructed by such campers any hour of the day Okay, I know you, you've referred, you know, there's been reference made, but we have obstruction ordinances, and we have all these other ordinances to deal with that. But that, that's, that doesn't matter, because when you looked at the Boise case, and then you look at Johnson, which is the subsequent Ninth Circuit case, and those district court cases, those aren't controlling authority here. The Ninth Circuit is controlling the authority here, okay? It, it resolves these disputes among the districts. Um, but when you put the put the whole package together, then what have you done? Well, uh, you're homeless and you don't have any place to go, and you're on this commuter trail where the park ordinance lets you be, uh, but you're violating the obstruction one. So we're we're moving you, or we're giving you a civil citation, or we're trespassing you, or whatever it is. 
um, you're in violation again. So it doesn't make sense to put this rush thing through. It doesn't do what it's promised to do. And you don't need to be a lawyer to see to see that. Is that All right, so that was uh, Kevin Hunt in reaction to this uh, new ordinance policy amendment. Um, finally, we get uh, our last quote, Shannon uh, Hart, Board of Directors of Youth, Youth Homes. And I do want to warn you guys that some of the stuff may be viewer discretion and advised in terms of the, some of the stories that she uh, has dealt with being near one of the trails uh, uh, near youth homes. homes. As most of you know, Youth Homes helps at-risk youth. We have homes here in Missoula, Hamilton, Helena, and Kalispell. We help kiddos from the age of four to 18. One of our shelters, uh, the Attention Home, is located on California Street right behind uh, the Blue Mountain Clinic. This home specifically is a shelter for children ages 14 to 18, and they've experienced a lot of trauma already when they come into the home. Our youth home staff has repeatedly had to call police because of urban camping, uh, dangers to our children and our staff. Our house, our property, our youth, our, our, sh our shelter abuts uh, the park right there, right along the river right there. So they're right next to each other. Um, there have been people sleeping on the picnic tables on youth homes property. Our kiddos used to play softball in the public area and hang out in our own purse in our yard, youth homes property, but they are no longer able to do that. Uh, last summer, a camper walked into the office at the attention home, uh, agitated and irate, and the camper stole Advil, not a big deal, from the front desk uh, before people arrived, before the police arrived. During warmer weather, our staff is there, and of course they have their windows open, so they hear everything all day, every day. And let me repeat that, they hear it daily. Every day, there's some type of interaction with the unhoused out there. Um, just last summer, five campers jumped another camper and beat him profusely while our kids were in our yard. Our executive director ran out to try and save the victim. Police were called. Um, later on that same day, a fire was started right outside of our home, and the police were called again. Um, last summer, a camper was shooting arrows at our attention home and at our kids while they were in the yard. Uh, the, narrows struck, the arrows struck the home and narrowly missed one staff member while outside. The kids all had to come inside for safety. The urban camper did get a weapons charge, um, and all this has been filed with the police. So you can verify those, um, those incidents. Um, later on, the kids witnessed one camper hit another camper in the face with a baseball bat. Done. Sorry, that was fast. Um, anyway, I just wanted to get up here and let you guys know that I know you have a really tough job. We all empathize with that, but we have some really serious, serious uh, health and safety is issues uh, with citizens as well. I don't want anybody to be criminally um, charged for being homeless, but there is a fraction of that population that is very dangerous to society as well. All right, so that was um, public comment by uh, one of the vice chairs of Youth Homes, uh, Shannon Hart. In the end, the city went to move this to Monday's consent agenda to determine if parks can be used uh, to limit access to overnight camping as it pertains to closing certain public access between 11 p.m. and 6 a.m. Uh, you know, in, in a way, it's kind of like, you know, how the, uh, the Missoula Public Library does their own, um, you know, they have the limited hours. It's a public space open for anybody and everybody. And, you know, it's just one of those things that is just kind of the an ongoing thing and, the only thing that the city's working on right now is to help mitigate the urban camping in city parks, uh, more public, frequently areas as well. So that's one of the big moves that the city is moving right now in terms of trying to solve homelessness in general. That is a bigger issue that many people just can't handle without um, forking over lots and lots of money to get the services to the people. Okay, so for more information, go to ci.missoula.mt.us to watch older meetings and upcoming agenda items like this one coming Monday. And that is your City Council report. Up next, we have uh, a clip from The Last Best Constitution featuring uh, Lynn Sparks Keeley, who was one of the delegates that helped draft the Montana Constitution with host Evan Barrett. So here it is. You know, I, I was looking at the variety of the size of our communities in Montana and maybe one of the larger cities needs whatever the number were that were li listed in the mm -hmm. Constitution as elected. But a smaller community might not need that. Mm -hmm. And so to have it written in the Constitution, I felt was kind of 
made it so every county had to have that, even though they didn't really need it. Yeah. Well, your vision of the Constitution is what constitutional scholars uh, say it's all about, which is to have a framework, you know, and not yes. to get into sp such specificity that it's a statute or right, and uh, it's it's a anchor around your neck because you can't mm -hmm. move from it. And uh, one of the things we we've, we've had a little bit of over the years is we've had a few things sneak into the Constitution through amendment that probably don't belong there. There's mm -hmm. there's a victim rights section in there now. And it was hard to argue against it because it was about victim rights. Rights. But it's like, it's it's a whole section of its own. It's huge. Yes, and, and it doesn't and, and, need and, to be part of the Constitution. Yeah. It needs to be part of the law. But the, those, those, by the way, come from uh, the ability of the electorate, the voters, to propose amendments to the Constitution by initiative. That if they think that the legislature, normally amendments go to the legislature. Right. They get 100 votes, then they go to the ballot. If they, but a lot of times they, citizens feel the legislature doesn't feel friendly about a, a pro, and they're just not going to do it. So they go out and sign petitions and get an initiative. That didn't exist under the old Constitution. No, All right, so didn't. that was uh, an interesting uh, um, tidbit of our old Constitution and our new Constitution and how it pertains to the citizens of, of Montana being able to draft laws based on uh, uh, popular uh, and also uh, necessary uh, opinions of, you know, grassroots. It really opened the door for a lot of grassroots um, uh, opportunities for a lot of people to do the Constitution, to be, uh, take, uh, uh, comfort in that the Constitution will protect their needs to express their uh, uh, legislative and law and bill needs and stuff like that. So, sorry, I probably shouldn't have written that down, but for the most part, you can watch that. Uh, Last Best Constitution is available on MCAT's uh, YouTube channel, MCAT TV Missoula. It's from Helena's Civic TV channel. So, Without further ado, we're going to jump into a little bit of events happening this weekend as well. I am about five minutes out until uh, the end of the show. I did have a late start this morning, but I do have so much more to talk about. Um, just in terms of just uh, what's happening um, here in the Missoula Public Library, Makerspace open hours start at uh, 9.30 on Fridays and 2.30 on Saturdays. Storytown and Tiny Tales, 10.30 Saturday and Sunday, I mean Friday and Saturday with uh, the... Uh, Tiny Tales taken out on Saturdays. Uh, yarns and watercolor, fourth floor of the Missoula Public Library. It's a great opportunity to do some yarns or you can do some watercoloring or a little bit of both. It happens every single Saturday. I believe watercoloring will eventually uh, sunset for the summer. We'll, I'll let you know when they, decide to move, uh, when they decide to stop doing it for the summer soon. So Spectrum does their own science presentation starting at 2 p.m. most days and they're open from 10 a.m. to about 6 p.m. Tuesdays through Saturdays. Lego Club, um, most Fridays at 2.30 p.m. in the afternoon. Adult Writers Group, Young Adult Writers Group, 3.30 p.m. It's, these are mostly all their ongoing events that happen in the Missoula Public Library with D&D for Teens on Saturdays and then Dungeons & Dragons also for adults on Friday at 6 p.m. Um, if you're interested in doing some um, uh, education and learning and physical activity and stuff like that, Red Willow Learning Center is one of the many uh, opportunities to get uh, uh, classes and additional education from Red Willow Learning Center apart from the Lifelong Learning Center. Family fun time at various locations starting around 10 a.m. You have YMCA, Mismo Gymnastics, and Ridge Jackers Sports Center do a lot of indoor activities for kids to want to stay active when they can't go outside. Missoula Food Bank Network have their meal distribution starting at 10 a.m. every Friday to about 1 p.m. This is a judgment-free zone for people to get cheap groceries uh, who are just trying to uh, squeeze their budget a little bit tighter. Jumping ahead, uh, Rocky Mountain Ballet Theater, Rite of Spring is gonna be at Westside Theaters tonight at 7 p.m. Uh, author event, Sarah E. McDonald, in her book about the Cancer Channel, One Year, Two Cancers, Three Miracles at 7 p.m. tonight at Fact and Fiction. Karaoke at the Jack Saloon at 7 p.m. Uh, live music, Modified Lockdown is gonna be at Cranky Sam playing rock music. Old Post is going to do a jam band with Larry Hirschberg. Cash for Junkers jam band is going to be at Union Club. Saturday we have the markets and such happening um, all through the summer well until October. 8 a.m. to about 1 p.m. Great opportunity for that kind of stuff. St. Regis is doing the 46th annual Memorial Day Week in Flea Market. 200 vendors set up their booths at Montana's largest flea market in 
St. Regis. You take exit number 33 off of I-90 and follow the signs to the community park. So it's roughly about 60 plus miles just out of town. Um, indigenous made Missoula, uh, am I sure about that? Okay, never mind. Forget about it. Indigenous made Missoula Summer Market is going to be at the Art Park and Missoula Art Museum starting at 9 a.m. on Saturday. Missoula Youth Rugby Union State Championship. Um, Fort Missoula pitch, so ranging from ages 10 to 18, all will be in attendance and playing throughout the day. Several varsity rugby college programs have committed to include recruiting events. Additionally, they will have information booths outlining the full scope of rugby community here in the U.S. Rugby is a full conduct, evasive sport, and is one of the fastest growing sports in the world. So that's happening at Fort Missoula. Uh, we have donuts and doodles every month at uh, this summer at the Missoula Public Library starting at 10 a.m. here, so you can ask for more information at the Missoula Public Library. The theme for May is, um, let's see, Montana Natural History Center is doing their program from at noon, and their, uh, geez, where is this? I have to skip ahead because I, I did not put a title on that one, but uh, Tech Connect, if you're interested in learning about technology, uh, Missoula Public Library is uh, bring your device that you can't understand can't, uh, and you're stuck. It is a great way to get hands-on help from the Missoula Public Library staff certain Saturdays starting at 10.30 a.m. in the uh, third floor. And then we got our Saturday activities that match the Ministry History Center. Wacky Wildflowers, learn about wildflowers in the state of Montana and beyond. Mon MCAT Saturday drop-ins um, is going to be happening here at MCAT every Saturday from 1 to 3. And it's a great workshop for kids who want to do some stop animation, movie making, editing, and stuff like that. So that about does it for my morning show. And I want to thank you guys. And for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ranf. There's still a lot going on. And I wish I would have gotten to talk a little bit more about MissCon. But there's a lot of events happening today and throughout the weekend with closing ceremonies on Monday. And a nice costume parade to kick off the event happening tonight at 6 p.m. So without further ado, and for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ranf.